This podcast is sponsored by Monrovia. For nearly 100 years, Monrovia has never stopped pursuing beauty. You can see it in the new plants they introduce and the way they grow them, down to their custom soil blends that help plants thrive. You'll find that beauty in everything Monrovia grows, from annuals to trees. Explore an incredible selection handpicked to make your garden exceptional. Shop now at monrovia.com. That's M-O-N-R-O-V-I-A dot com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who just love, love, love their plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm the Associate Editor at Fine Gardening. Hi, and I'm Danielle. You know by now. I'm the Executive Editor at Fine Gardening, and Carol and I are here to argue about plants. But first... But first, loyal listeners, we didn't make this an ad because we don't want you skipping over it. But listen, we've got this lecture series on sustainability that is coming up starting April 1st. So as you're listening to this podcast, you have six more days to sign up and register for this lecture series. And at this point, Carol, we have seen all four of the classes they're amazing. They're so good. It's, It's so much fun. It's like going to a conference, but you can do it right from home. Exactly. And it's on demand, guys. It's not like you have to tune in live for this. If you register, you can watch these classes all on your own at any point in time you want to. Four o'clock in the morning, you want to watch a class on sustainability? Go for it. Two o'clock in the afternoon? Go for it. So anywho, you've got six days. So go to finegardening.com to register. I don't want you guys to miss out. Neither does Carol. We worked really hard on this. Go, go, go. All right. Now, What is our topic today? Has nothing to do with sustainability. It is skinny plants. And Carol, what a weird topic, huh? (laughs) I at first I was like, oh my goodness, what am I even gonna talk about? But then you realize, yeah, there are there are actually a lot of skinny plants and and they're useful, right? Especially if you have a smaller garden. Absolutely. Well, that's a good point. So why would one use skinny plants? Smaller footprint, right? You know, yeah. so you're not, you're able to get in more in a small space because it doesn't take up as much square footage. Um, I have an extremely tall house, you know, a three-story on a hill house. So I use a lot of tall, skinny plants to bring the scale of the house down, especially, you know, on corners following, you know, the landscaper's principle of taking the scale of the house down. Um, What are some other reasons for skinny plants? I've got a spot where I needed to screen something fast. They took out a uh, sort of hedgerow between me and the neighbor and I needed cover. (laughs) (laughs) Quick cover. Yeah. Yeah. So I got some uh, Montrose spire, that's not one of the ones that I'm going to be talking about, but that's a spruce and they are tall and skinny and I stuck them right between our like bathroom and living room windows and the view of our neighbors and, you know, instant cover that's and then the- you can plant around them, you know. Yeah, that's that's a great. I I I hadn't thought of that. That was not on my list. But yeah, that's a great use for skinny plants. And I think a lot of times too, people are just you know the awkward spaces. You know the space that that tiny little strip that's next to the driveway in the house that nothing else you know really fits in. Um, but you know that that relates back to a small square square footage that you have. But yeah, skinny plants are neat, and you know. They're the they're instant focal points. You know, they kind of stick out like in, a lot of times they're referred to as exclamation points in the landscape because they do. They when done properly, they stick out nicely as a focal point as opposed to a sore thumb and really give you that instant. Oh, my eye goes right to that very fastidious looking plant, which is kind of cool. All right. So you're not going to mention Montrose spruce. What are you going to mention? I have planted with the Montrose Spire spruces. I have White Pillar Rose of Sharon. Whoa. Yeah. That, and, you threw me for a loop with that one. I did not see your list ahead of time. I'm excited. Yeah. And I mean, I've never grown Rose of Sharon, but I think a lot of people are familiar with the species. And uh, that is Hibiscus seriacus. 
And white pillar is a trade name. So the um, actual botanical name is Gandini Van Art. Ooh. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Art has got two A's. I'm thinking this might be a Netherlands person it's named after, but I don't, I don't know the story. But um, white pillar is what you will see it for sale as. And it's a proven winners. And so we, mine was a sample that was sent to us, I'm guessing maybe five years ago. And it was little then. It was like maybe three feet tall, very narrow, like, you know, maybe eight, eight or 10 inches across. Mm -hmm. And it has sprouted up. It's about 10 feet tall now. Mm -hmm. um, they get 10 to 16 feet tall and two to three feet wide. And so it stays nice and tight. And uh, so far, I'm really liking it. It's, it's a cool plant, adaptable, easy care. It tolerates poor soil and heat and humidity and drought. Um, it does like full sun. So that's something that you to keep in mind when citing it. Um, and also, if you give it a two to three inch layer of shredded bark, no matter what your soil is, this is something it will probably appreciate. And well-drained soil is a must. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, super unfussy and... It has these double white flowers, beautiful, like really they glow and they come midsummer to late okay. summer. But for me, it really gets going in August and then they go right through until frost usually. Nice. Um, it's deer resistant. They say it's deer resistant, but I didn't get flowers for like the first three years. And I realized is I think Bambi likes to nip the flower buds off. <laughs> <laughs> They don't eat too much of the rest of it, but boy, I guess those flower buds are like some kind of like tasty treat for deer. So once it got to be like eight feet tall and the deer can't easily nip the flower buds off, ah. I got flowers all over the top of the bush. And then I um, started spraying it with deer spray and I got some lower down. So I would, you know, I don't know. Deer resistant, yes. Deer proof, definitely not. Yeah, right. Is there any such thing, right? right. <laughs> I can understand the deer though, because the Rose of Sharon buds, when they swell up, they're huge. You know, it's, you know, kind of the size of, I don't know, a half dollar sometimes size. They get really puffy. Yeah. It, it's, I love, I love the white too, but you can get purple pillar. That's mm -hmm. also available if you like the, the, that rosy purple color of Rose of Sharon, but the white, they're really, they're luminous and it's, they self clean too. They drop off when they're done. So you don't have to go, you know, deadhead or anything. That's awesome. All right. So talk to me about this Rose of Sharon because Rose of Sharon's in the past all that I have as my point of reference is my grandmother's backyard that had a Rosa Sharon that was the standard single blossomed Rosa Sharon. And every year, I swear, that thing seeded at least a thousand babies underneath oh. it. It was super self seeding. And I know Rosa Sharon's like the standard species, Syracuse is a self sower like crazy. But I, uh, what I've been reading about a lot of the new hybridization not so much. Are you noticing thousands of seedlings all over the place? I don't think I've even gotten one seedling. Oh, that's it, awesome. It may be because I wasn't getting flowers, but it doesn't seem to me like it is self-seeding. That's um, awesome. Yeah. One thing I want, I, I put a picture in the, the show notes. I've got one of it in flower in the summer, but I followed a reader's tip from years ago this fall because I was worried we get these ice storms in Southern Connecticut that are just destructive and you if you have a plant that's fastidious um the tip was that you wrap it sort of candy cane style in twine nice and it holds all those the branches up together for the winter and then i will cut the the twine in the spring and it'll go back to doing what it does but it's a nice way that you can do it with like sky pencil holly or you know any any of these upright plants to sort of keep them from getting broken branches or splayed or damaged from the ice yeah that's a great idea i mean that's that's oftentimes how nurseries transport any sort of you know woody plants as they do that candy cane tw twine it's super easy it's super quick you know you just kind of rrr, 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 all the way up and then so easy to get off because you know for ease cut it and it splays out like you know 
Clark W. Griswold, it's Christmas tree, right? And <laughs> except not as wide, except not as wide on the fastidious plants. Nice. All right. I'm going to have to check out that Rosa Sharon. Um, yeah, you could not get a tougher plant either than Rosa Sharon, you know, lean soils, dry soils, it, 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 it perseveres. Yeah. Hardy zones five to nine. It's, it's just like an all around, almost anyone could grow it. That's awesome. All right. Well, I went into the evergreen realm and the first thing that pops into my mind when I think of a fastidious plant is um, upright Japanese plum yew, which is cephalotaxis herontonii fastigiata. Um, you know, cephalotaxis, I feel like it, it unfairly gets lumped in with taxis, with regular yew, right? You know, these little meatballs that are in front of every 1950s home. Ugly, ugly, ugly shrub. Sorry to anyone who loves a regular old you. Um, <laughs> but cephalotaxis is, is not the same plant. It's an evergreen conifer, yes, but it's got these really, really thick needles. And the needles kind of occur in tufts along these succulent-ish branches. So it, it kind of ends up looking like, you know, a little Dr. Susie. It's got some character to it. Um, it looks like little chimney sweep brushes, basically. And this, you know, the upright version, the fastigiata, is really, really compact. So eventually it's going to reach 10 feet tall, but it's really only going to have a, a footprint of about four feet or so. Um, and the great thing is about cephalotaxis, these Japanese plum yews, they are deer resistant, not deer proof, but deer resistant. So unlike regular taxis, which is, you know, a regular yew that just get decimated by deer, the they tend to not eat this guy. Um, and apparently it's because it's got a little bit of toxin to its needles. Um, but partial to full shade too, which I kind of like, you know, it's, it's somewhat hard to find conifers that will tolerate shade. And this is one that will. It's also extremely heat tolerant. So I can't speak to this from experience other than just seeing it down south. But cephalotaxis zones five to nine and in zones eight and nine, you know, really into the deep south, this plant does extremely well. And, you know, talking to gardeners down there, apparently a lot of that has to do with it's very, very tolerant of their alkaline soils and very, very tolerant of clay soils as well. So, you know, when you start getting into that caliche soil and really, really dense, it does really well down there. Um, not a problem up here in in New England, but definitely something to mention for for listeners in the southern southern spot. Um, I will say, you know, the upright, the regular upright Japanese plum yew is just a straight green. The new growth kind of comes out a bright, bright, almost chartreuse color in the spring, and then eventually fades to a dark, deep green. But there's an awesome cultivar um, called Korean gold, which has that really, really nice gold variegation on the mature foliage. So it still comes out chartreuse, but then fades to kind of a green on gold modeling. And it's really, really striking. Um, this is a perfect plant to, you know, put on the corner of your house to kind of bring down the scale of it, or even as a little exclamation point in the garden um, into Crumbolts, which is a garden, uh, a gardener that we've featured her garden in our magazine several times. She has that Korean gold Japanese plum you all throughout her beds and it's really versatile because it can go from a sunnier spot into a shadier spot and you keep seeing those repeating exclamation points it's really striking um so again that's cephalotaxis herontonii fastigiata and that's an upright japanese plum you a great exclamation point for shade all right, Carol. So earlier you mentioned sky pencil, Ilex crenado as, you know, kind of the classic fastidious plant. It's an evergreen. I just talked about plum yew, which is an evergreen. Do you have any evergreens on your list? Do I have any evergreens? Let me look. Um, oh, I, I threw, do. You, oh, I do. I, it wasn't <laughs> the one I was going to talk about next. I threw I her could. a curveball. I threw I her a curveball. You want to talk about an evergreen? Let's do back-to-back -back evergreens. I'll do an evergreen. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Cool. So I have, my evergreen is green arrow Alaskan cedar. <gasps> and Ooh. yeah. Oh my gosh. This is a cool plant. So the botanical name there is some debate 
um, when we had this in the magazine, we call it Camociparis nutcatensis green arrow, but you can find it as Calliotropsis nutcatensis, Cuprosis nutcatensis, or the new kid on the block, Xanthocyparis nutcatensis. These freaking DNA plant people, they just keep testing these plants and coming up with new genuses. It's yeah. so annoying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's cool though. It's yeah, cool, I know. it is. This one, they have not settled it as far as I can tell. So I'm just sticking with Camisipris, but be aware that you may see it under other things. And Green Arrow is the cultivar. This is one that um, I've actually seen in multiple gardens, but the one I remember it most from is Jim Kincannon in Indianapolis, who had, a, there was, I think it was probably two years ago. Um, his garden has a couple of these and they're sort of toward the back of this spectacular bed of, you know, mostly tropical plants. And this is a tall, like moody, like cool, quirky, uh, wonderful silhouette. It's, it's goes after the first few tiers of branches, which sort of come out from the trunk, it shoots straight up. And then once it gets to a certain height, the new branches tend to cling and, and hang down from the trunk. So it's got like a sort of a sweeping, pendulous branch structure. And that beautiful, like Camisipris has the flat, uh, scaly needles. And so this is just beautiful, beautiful texture. And it looks great, I think, with pretty much any kind of garden style. Uh, looks great next to any other plant. Hardy from zones four to seven. This is actually a native plant in our northwest co coast. So from Northern California all the way up to Alaska, which got its name, it got its name from that. Um, 18 to 35 feet tall, two to five feet wide. Super, super, super narrow. Awesome. Yeah. And I, you know, because it's so narrow, I was looking for a photo to put in the show notes that would show its full height and, and the habit. And it was so skinny that I, <laughs> I pasted another picture next to it. So it's more of like a normal photo format. And that second picture shows the texture up close. Nice. Um, but good from a distance, good from far away. Um, quite adaptable as drought tolerant once established. It does prefer consistently moist, well-drained soil. It likes full sun to very, very light open shade, kind of picture where it would be growing in, in nature. It might be growing around other plants like it, but it probably is getting a lot of sun to put on mm -hmm. that growth. And, um, Green arrow is the fastigiate weeping form. There's also one called pendula, I think, which gets a little wider. So if you're looking for something that's got a similar texture, but a little bulkier, look for a pendula. But I just, uh, green arrow is the one for me. This is one I would love to have. This is crazy because I have this and <gasps> it's it's new. It's, it's only, I want to say it's maybe three years old and I got it from Broken Arrow Nursery um green arrow broken arrow no no relation they didn't breed the plant but um they have a mature one that is in the entry uh, kind of the driveway it's not even i don't think part of their their gardens um their you know display gardens um but i had made a poor plant choice. I had put a curly willow on one of the corners of my house and the curly willow, like what a dumb plant to put there. It got huge. It got bulky. It grew fast. It had, you know, these aerial roots that kept coming out and really messing everything up. So with the voles help, it got girdled. And so I pulled it out, I plucked it out, I threw it in a different corner of the yard and, um, I replaced it with green arrow. Now, the one thing I will say is my green arrow is so tiny, tiny. You know what? Now I'm, I'm in, I'm encouraged. I'm going to go out. I'll take a picture and I'll put my green arrow up on because 
in three years, it's, oh man, it's gone from like a one gallon pot where maybe it was a foot tall to maybe now it's like three feet. So I have high hopes that it's going to start shooting up quicker. Um, I never looked at what the growth rate was on it. So I might be retired and selling my house by the time it gets to my the 35 feet that I want it to be. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think eventually it does hit its stride and, and shoot up. But yeah, it you know what it reminds me of those branches? You were doing such a good job explaining them. They're kind of, you know, these pendulous. It's like Stevie Nicks's outfits, you know, from Fleetwood Mac. She had like those kind of caped, drapey, uh, you know, shirts that she would always wear. And honestly, it looked, I, I call it the Stevie Nicks plant because that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, or like some, you know, an opera singer with the huge sleeves or something. Yes. Very dramatic. It's, yes, it's so very cool. dramatic very dramatic so I am so thrilled that you talked about the, that plant because I didn't even think about putting it on my list that's awesome it is a very cool plant and I will report back as the years go on in this podcast on how quickly mine grows um I I had to put a, a plant that I'm gonna dovetail on to you that I'm gonna do a plant that I don't grow but that I want I really really want it um and it's laced up elderberry, which is Sambucus nigra. All right, get ready for the letters. SNR1292, zones four to seven. That's all you need to know. Laced up elderberry, zones four to seven. And yes, dear listeners, this is a fastidious elderberry. So we're talking six to eight feet tall, around four feet wide. Gotta say the ones that I've seen, mostly I think in two botanic gardens have only been about two feet wide, but I'm not sure if you know, that's just a, a juvenile plant. Full sun to partial shade, that dark blackish lacy foliage, which is so beautiful on sh directly straight upright branches that kind of extend out a little bit at the top, splay out just a bit. So it kind of has a skinny base like habit. Um, and then in early summer, like with your elderberries that you're used to, it gets those large pink umbel flowers that just, you know, bless your heart if you can find a picture without bees and pollinators all over those umbel flowers because pollinators go bananas over elderberry. Um, it's followed by bluish blackish berries. Those flowers are, but uh, you, you don't really notice the berries as much on the black foliage elderberries because it's kind of black on black, purple on purple, but it's deer and rabbit resistant. And in comparison to uh, you know, black lace, I think is the standard elderberry that, that has that black lacy foliage. You know, black lace gets 10 by 10. That is a ginormous shrub. So with this one only coming in at, you know, maybe six feet tall and four feet wide, you're cutting that way back almost in half. So I, I want this plant I think it looks a little weird, but I think in the right circumstance, surrounded by the right partners, this would be an awesome, awesome plant. And it's fairly new. It just came out. I think it came into the trade, into nurseries in 2018, 19. So fairly new, but um, oh, I want it. I want it so bad. That's laced up elderberry zones four to seven. Have you seen this one, Carol? I and I haven't, but I have black lace. Oh. So, and I can imagine, and black lace, I have to cut, I have to almost treat it like a cutback because like you said, it gets real sprawly and it takes over its neighbors. So this, this one sounds like a winner. All right. So if I find it, I'll order two. Carol, I am surprised that neither one of us have picked an ornamental grass at this point. I'm not going to make you do it if you have an ornamental grass, but do you have an ornamental grass? I do not have an ornamental grass because I peeked and I saw you oh. have an ornamental grass. Um, and do, that's I the do. one that I would have done. So uh. oh, perfect. All right. Well, so give it to me. Are you are you staying in the tree and shrub realm? Are you moving to perennial land? I move into perennial land and nice. I'm moving to something that would actually look great with big grasses. It oh, is nice. giant coneflower. This mm -hmm. is Rubeckia maxima, and it is hardy from zones four to nine. This thing gets five to seven feet tall. So you're thinking, you know, like coneflowers, cute little bushy things. No, 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 no. 
This has like a basal foliage mound that can get three to four feet wide. And then it shoots up these like giant long five to seven foot tall stems topped with golden corn cone flowers with the most exaggerated big cone. So it's like almost a hat sitting on top of the back swept <laughs> petals. Oh my goodness. It is so quirky. <laughs> And, you know, so, that was the best description. <laughs> that was the best description. They, we said tall and skinny. We didn't say straight. This, you know, these, they can get all weird and wild and wonky, these stems, but um, they sort of, they stay toward the middle unless you have really rich soil or too much shade or too much water. They really want it lean and dry like they would have on the prairie where they're mm -hmm. native to um, central and southern United States. And so if, if, you, if you do have rich soil, you can grow them, but you're going to have to stake them. And the picture that I put in the notes, you'll see, they, they did have to stake it at Mount Cuba Center, where this was part of the South Garden, um, which is a cool like mid-Atlantic native plants and North American native plants used in sort of a card, cottage garden style. Um, and boy, it really, really worked for that. It was, you know, one of those charismatic plants that you think of when you think of cottage gardens. Um, and Donna Wiley, who's the horticulture at Mount Cuba Center, gave us a tip that we published a while back for this plant. After those giant cone flowers are done and the goldfinches have picked all the seeds out of them, you can cut that, those um, flower stems back and any of the foliage that's looking ragged and it will make beautiful new foliage for the fall season and the fo the that basal foliage is like it's like a whole other plant um oh, like a job. bonus plant it's beautiful it's like gray green glaucous um gorgeous so it's like two plants for the price of one I like that. That's a good PR agent right there. Two plants for the price of one. Yeah, that foliage, you know, I, it, it's it's hard, you know, because then it competes with those incredible, you know, bottle rockets that shoot up with the with the yellow. But that foliage is pretty awesome. And those leaves are big. I mean, we're talking Nicotiana style big leaves and that glaucousy blue. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sold, sold, sold. Done, done, done. Yes, yes, yes. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Well, all right. So uh, I'll dovetail here again. I'm going to do a North American native, but I'm going to do a grass. Got to do a grass because, you know, there's a lot of um, ornamental grasses that are beasts and they'll take over and they get really huge and wide and splay. But um, I'm doing a little blue stem and it's actually a cultivar called purple arrow. Um, I do have some little blue stem. I do not have this particular cultivar purple arrow and that's schizocarium, uh, scop scoparium, and it's N-O-N-W-R-R. -R. All right, whatever. It's purple arrow. <laughs> and, uh, I guess I realized, I know that little blue stems were North American natives. I figured that they were Midwest, Prairie, Northern Plains, but I didn't realize until I researched this particular plant that uh, little, uh, little blue stem is native in the lower 48 states, all of them, except for Nevada. <laughs> So, so I guess Nevada doesn't get any love, but all of the lower 48 states. So this is a really, really great uh, native grass. It's purple arrow is going to be two to three feet tall and only about a foot to a foot and a half wide. So very, very narrow columnar growth habit. Um, it gets these beautiful, like kind of bluish green um, fronds to it or, or blades to it that have a slight purple tinge. Um, it's very compact. They said that they named it purple arrow because it's arrow shaped, but kind of like an inverted arrow. So you kind of get that, you know, vase like habit to it. But that gray purple foliage um, is spooky, moody. I don't know how else to describe it. It's really interesting. And it goes a tawny red in fall. Like a lot of blue stems do get really good fall color. And this is one of them that's going to get kind of a burgundy color. And it has beautiful taupe 
feather flag like plumes that come out in the late summer. They eventually go all beige towards the fall, but that's really, uh, you know, it's kind of pretty. It gives you that nice texture and that fall beigey color is really, really nice. Um, I saw this purple arrow is, is not the easiest to find. I guess it's only been in the trade for a few years. I saw it at, at Chicago Botanic Garden and it was just really striking because it, it looks like like somebody had tied it up you know like there was fishing twine that I couldn't see that was making this little blue stem very well behaved but there wasn't so obviously it's tight compact habit is really it's it's claim to fame so um I'm a big fan and also of no little blue stems are the 2022 perennial plant of the year that entire um genus species or the perennial plant of the year for 2022 so I like to be on trend so here you go purple arrow little blue stem you have blue stems Carol right I, I have standing ovation and I nice. love it um, nice. I think that it uh, that it is probably a little smaller than purple arrow mm -hmm. I think yeah I think standing ovation does it it'll it maxes out at maybe two feet yeah, maybe two and a half. It's pretty yeah. small. I need to move it more to a, a front place where you can see it because it get it gets hidden by other things. Nice, nice. Yeah. So a relocation. Put that relocation. exclamation point out front. <laughs> Carol, I'm loving the array we've got. We we did evergreens. We had a tree slash small tree slash shrub. We had another shrub. We've got perennials. We've got grasses. I don't know what what could you possibly have next. I have a, uh, it's a perennial and mm -hmm. it is a native perennial, but nice. um, dog fennel. Oh, it's a, so this is a, this is a perennial that looks a little bit like an evergreen. Like I'm thinking this is sort of a um, bargain version of cephalotaxis. Nice. And, <laughs> um, dog fennel, the straight species, which is Eupatorium capillifolium is native to uh, a wide swath of the central and southern United States. And it has a reputation for being seedy and weedy and growing in ditches. And so <laughs> if you, <laughs> and it has- so Put it in a more naturalized corner of the garden. Right, well, and so uh, elegant feather dog oh. fennel is a sterile cultivar that doesn't produce seed. And so it is a way to grow this fantastic thing um, without worrying about it seeding all over your garden. Gotcha. Yeah. I like that. I like yeah. that. So it gets three to six feet tall, one to three feet wide, and it puts out these like multiple upright branches with very feathery foliage that um, that name, the species name Capillifolium means hair like leaves. And so that, you know, it's almost like um, an asparagus, the, the, the foliage of asparagus. Okay. So, you know, like uh, a filler in a bouquet is what yeah. I'm thinking. And so I saw this at Longwood and they had it planted with some other like super cool. Um, they had it with some annual salvias and they had in other interesting foliage plant. I think they had a, a tree dahlia with it. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a texture that you can mix in with other, with more coarse textures or with darker colors. And it's going to just give you this nice backdrop. Um, really easy care plant too, as you can imagine it being a ditch weed in its like native <laughs> habitat. <laughs> well, <I'm>, <laughs> you've been doing such a good job as a PR agent this whole episode, Carol. I think you might have. I think you might have tripped up on that one. Do you it's think I let poor uh, elegant feather down? Well, <laughs> but no, you know, no, that speaks to its to its resiliency. You know, you could it. grow this plant in a ditch. That's <laughs> it. You know, so maybe this is what you put at your hell strip, or you know, out in a place that you can't water it because it is it it likes. Moist, well-drained soil, but it will tolerate most soil types, including dry, sandy soil, poor soil. Um, and it's, think, al although it's a um, perennial, it does have sort of the presence of woody, those upright stems that it has are, are almost like a little teeny trunks. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm thinking this might be a candidate for my hospital hill, you know, lean, well-drained, full sun, 
you know, ditch, ditch appropriate. I mean, that's, I, I do. I feel like this is, I'm writing this down. I'm writing this down. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll stop interrupting. <laughs> that's a, um, it's a great screening plant too. So, mm -hmm. and I feel it will definitely think it's less expensive than a similar sized a conifer that mm -hmm. would have that fine foliage. Um, but I, th I think it's just, it could be a very useful plant and I don't see it a lot. So I, I think I would like to try this and I, I would love to see more people trying this plant. Yeah. So, but absolutely. remember, get elegant feather and not the straight species. And not the straight species. Yeah. Is this like, I, I, I don't even recall ever seeing this for sale at nurseries in the perennial section. I mean, maybe this has got to be a mail order plant for us. Have you ever seen it around here? I haven't. No, okay. I haven't. So I'm, I'm curious, but I think you can, I think I should double check, but I think I saw <laughs> elegant feather for sale when I was doing my research for this. So okay, hopefully, nice, nice. hopefully y'all can find it too, if you're interested. I like it. I like it a lot. I, it, oh my gosh. It, it's a ditch weed. I mean, that's so great. I love it. All right. I'm going to end out on a true tree. You know, we had Rosa Sharon, which is kind of, you know, large shrub, small tree status. It, you know, it kind of falls in between, but this is a straight up tree. Um, and it's the it's the one that pops into my head when I think of skinny fastidiate trees and it's slender silhouette sweet gum and that's liquid umbar slender silhouette it's zones five to nine um man this is gonna seem like I got this these dimensions wrong but I swear to you these are right so it's up to 50 feet tall and only six feet wide as a tree <laughs> So it's full sun, average soil. Sweet gums tend to be very um, pollution tolerant, lean soil tolerant. You'll see a regular standard sweet gum tree used a lot as a street tree. Um, it doesn't have a lot of aerial roots or anything like that. It's a pretty well behaved tree that takes a beating. Um, I, I when I was looking this up, I, I've seen this. I do not personally grow this particular sweet gum, um, slender silhouette, but I've seen this grown to perfection in in a couple of different private gardens, and then also in a botanic garden down in Kentucky. But um, everyone describes it as quirky, and I I can't do any better than that. It is a quirky looking tree. Um, it has these beautiful five star like or five point star like leaves to it, which is a standard sweet gum leaf. Um, excellent fall color. They're a standard deep green, you know, through spring, summer. And then when the temperatures start to get a little bit cooler and it doesn't take much, they turn fire engine, red, orange, and yellow. Um, sweet gums are known as one of the most beautiful fall foliage trees next to maybe a sugar maple. Um, it does produce those little spiky balls that look like little mace balls um, that are the seed pods. I think they're very cool. A lot of people say that they're annoying when you have to, you know, mow around them or walk across these spiky balls. But the cool thing about this slender silhouette if you can imagine this crazy columnar tree, they all fall within a six foot radius. So you can go through there and just suck them up with, you know, your battery operated leaf blower, rake them up really easily if they're not your jam. Um, they're great for property lines, great for screening. It's just this giant exclamation point in the landscape. Um, and I just, I can see it being used really, really nicely as, you know, a, on the edge of a landscape or on the border of a woodland area. So you're going to have that definition, right, between the really, really more landscaped portion of your property and then the wooded edge or the more wild edge you've got this kind of defined tree that's that's marking the the property line basically or between cultivated and uncultivated but again that slender silhouette sweet gum it's liquid is the uh is the botanic name slender silhouette and that's zones five to nine um there was question about zone 4b so it might it might be applicable there as well. But um, yeah, it's the Dr. Seuss of trees. Love it. And now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about being skinny. 
As a rather tall and lean gentleman myself, I'd like to point out that all of the good things that have been said about skinny plants in this episode do not necessarily translate to human beings. For a tall and skinny plant, the designation equates to a luring focal point. For a human, it often means sticking out like a sore thumb. I'm always the one at a performance who is asked to slouch down so those behind me can see. As a young boy, I was the one teachers asked to stand in the back on the end to blend in a bit more for school pictures. If there's a crowded lift, uh, um, sorry, uh, make that elevator, inevitably the door is held and I'm told, oh, you'll be able to squeeze in. But what if I don't want to squeeze in? What if I prefer to wait for the next one and ride to the 11th floor comfortably instead of jammed in like a sardine in a can? Such is the plight of the tall, lean person. Skinny plants, as we've heard, can be placed at the corner of a house foundation and bring the scale of a landscape more into proportion. If I were to stand at the core of my home for an extended period of time, I'm quite sure the nosy neighbour across the street would contact the authorities. Plants with a slender silhouette are often described as exclamation points in the garden. As an editor of 40 plus years, I can tell you that the exclamation point is the least respectable form of punctuation. And the fact that my frame could be described as such is somewhat disheartening. I feel I may have gone a bit off topic here and aired some deep-seated personal grievances. But alas, you've forgiven me these transgressions for 107 episodes, so I hope you'll allow me to squeeze in at least one more. Like, say, a tall, skinny man entering a crowded elevator. You know, when Peter goes off on these tangents, it's pretty funny, but I loved being able to picture a nine-year-old, tall, six-foot, skinny Peter, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm neither tall nor skinny, so I'm kind of jealous, actually. (laughs) Well, let's find out if our expert is tall, skinny, or just enjoys skinny plants. Let's see who's up next. Hello, this is Richie Steffen, Executive Director of the Elizabeth C. Miller Botanical Garden near Seattle, and I'm here to talk about great fastidia and skinny plants for the garden. The Miller Garden runs a plant education program called Great Plant Picks. It focuses on proven performers for the maritime Pacific Northwest, but many of these plants will grow well in other areas of the country. Each year we pick out a garden theme, and this year's Great Plant Picks garden theme is Smart Plants for Small Spaces. One of the groups we focus on is Plants for Snug Spaces. We all have these tight, narrow, thin beds and small areas in the garden. Maybe it's a container where plants get too wide, This is where these fastidiate, narrow, and skinny plants are key to adding an extra oomph to the landscape. The vertical lines are very eye-catching, and they draw your eye towards it. It's a great way to draw people through the garden and towards an area. I thought today what I would do is pick out three of my favorite fastidiate plants at the Miller Garden and share them with you. The first one is Compact Golden Columnar Yew, Taxus Baccata standishii. It is a very stately evergreen conifer. It has a very much an air of sophistication and formality to it. I first saw this plant at the Miller Garden was drawn to its upright, tight habit. The new growth is golden yellow and fades slowly through the summer to a golden blush over the older foliage, which is a deep dark green and heightens that yellowy color of the new branchlets. It's very tough and easy to grow. It's also very prunable. It withstands thinning and reducing the size of our plant. It's also wonderfully slow growing, so it's tighter and more dense than some other columnar use. It'll uh, grow best in full sun or bright open shade. It will tolerate more shade, but you don't get great gold color in it uh, on their plant in the, the sun or bright open shade for the best in the golden color. It only puts on about six to eight inches of growth per year. Uh, Roughly a 10-year height on it would be four to five feet tall and about 15 to 18 inches wide. A mature height would be about 10 to 12 feet tall and 24 to 30 inches wide. We have had issues with them splitting a little bit in the snow, and so often in the winter we'll take and wrap them with a little twine to keep them uh, from splitting in there. But if we do get a branch that splits, we simply cut it back to the inside and then it'll re-sprout back out and fill in over time. One thing I would do is watch for deer. Deer do like use, and you can have some unintended and excessive pruning uh, from your deer friends. This is also a male form of use. So there is a week or two in spring where there's a lot of heavy pollen production, 
Uh, but generally, there's no berries produced. But in rare circumstances, male ewes can produce female branches for a year or two. So you get a handful of berries on them, but then they revert back to male forms. It's a very hardy plant growing in USDA zones 5 through 8, tolerating temperatures down to minus 10 to minus 20 degrees. The next columnar plant uh, or narrow plant that I'm going to share with you is a dwarf conifer that we just started growing a few years ago. It's a uh, dwarf arborvitae called Primo arborvitae, Thuya occidentalis. And Primo is the uh, trademarked name of it and what you'd find it available out in the nurseries as. It is a uh, irregular upright grower and it has a, almost a very sculptural rustic feel to it. When we grow, uh, we grow it in containers with other dwarf shrubs and perennials, and it looks almost like a little bit of, like it's been bonsai in there. It has a very interesting uh, shape to it. Resist the urge to prune this plant. It can really ruin that rigid, interesting growth habit. So it's best left unpruned and left to develop all on its own. It's excellent for containers, although it will do fine in the ground. It only puts on about two to four inches of growth per year. A plant in 10 years would, in the ground would be about three feet tall and maybe about 18 inches wide. And a mature plant would be about six feet tall and maybe 30 to 36 inches wide. This grows best in full sun to open a bright shade. In full sun in the winter, especially in areas with colder winters, it'll turn kind of a bronzy color. If you want it to stay a little bit more green, plant it in some shade and you'll get more of those green tones uh, that hold through the winter. It is extremely hardy, down to USDA zones 3 to 8, uh, tolerating temperatures down to minus 30 to minus 40 degrees. This is another one that is probably susceptible to deer. Our plants have never been nibbled by deer, but uh, they are known to feed on arborvitae, so be proactive to keep this dwarf conifer looking its best. The last plant is not a woody plant at all, and it, we often don't think about perennials as uh, being narrow and useful in small spaces. And uh, I am a huge fan of ferns, and so uh, this is a perfect fern for kind of a bright, open, shady location. It is Tokyo wood fern, Dryopteris tokyoensis. It's native to Japan, and it has this very upright, graceful growth, slightly vase-shaped, and it's a very easy fern to grow. It does well in average garden soils. It does like regular watering during the summertime to do its best. And it's very, very adaptable. We do well with it here in our cooler, wetter climate of the Pacific Northwest, but it also does well in the hotter, more humid climate of the East Coast. It is a deciduous fern, so it, it dies down in the fall. But in the spring, the new unfurling fronds that come up, the, those uh, lovely crosiers, are vivid green and unravel and give you a nice, vibrant color uh, from spring in through summer. It doesn't really deepen into a dark green, so it always looks bright and fresh. And uh, it'll grow to about 24 to 30 inches tall and about 18 to 24 inches wide. It is also pretty hardy down to uh, USDA zones 5 to 8, minus 10 to minus 20 Fahrenheit. So there are a few plants and a few ideas for narrow, tight spaces in your garden, and I hope uh, one of those will fit the bill for you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. Gosh, you know, there's nothing bad I can say about Richie Stefan other than the fact that he always recommends plants in the magazine and now in this podcast episode that I want to grow. But I don't live in Seattle. I don't live out west. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's one of our occupational hazards, all this like plant longing that is instilled in us. I love that. I love that. It is an occupational hazard. That's fun. 